All right, welcome back to economics. We are moving on to chapter 12, and we're going to look at this idea of evaluating our economy. Uh, as we're recording this, we are spring of 2020, and I would ask uh, the students when we lectured on Wednesday, kind of how are we doing? And I got a lot of chats back saying, we're not doing very well. And I would say, well, how do you quantify that? How do you put that into numbers? You know, we can say we're doing well, we're not doing well, we're doing okay. But can we put it into numbers? Can we put it into a way that would help say, yeah, we're not doing great, but how not great? Right? How, how challenging are times? You know, is this like the Great Depression? Uh, back in the 1920s and 30s, is this like the Great Recession 2008-9? Is it something different, right? Um, and we would ask them, what are kind of the measuring sticks? And some of the ideas that were thrown out were unemployment, and we'll deal with that next chapter. Um, inflation would pop up there as well, but the, but the biggest one, um, in my opinion, is this idea of something called gross domestic product. So how well is your country doing? How do you quantify that? Uh, what other measures are out there? We've, we've talked about a few of those. So let's start out with GDP. Uh, it is the dollar value of all final goods and services that are produced within a country's borders and they're tracked on a yearly basis. And we had a student uh, Google that for us and they said that as of 2018, These were the numbers we found. $20.5 trillion was our gross domestic product, right? So 20 with a whole boatload of zeros after that. So if we had a way, found a way to add up every single economic transaction that happened, right? Every time somebody did something, this was the number that was reported. And we'll dig into what it is. We'll dig into what it isn't. And then we'll ask the question, how well does that represent what we did in 2018? So we're gonna start out with our first one being consumption. Um, we'll call that personal consumption expenditures, or at least that's the economic term, but that's you and me spending our money on stuff. But what stuff would we spend our money on? Um, 60% of that is services, 30% of that is non-durable goods, uh, and 10% of that is durable goods. Okay, and when we look at it, when I say we are the drivers of the economy, what I'm saying is historically between 60 to 70% of our total GDP comes from us us voluntarily paying for services like cell phones and haircuts and going to movies and paying people to mow our lawn, you know, businesses, not like your neighbor kid. Um, that is us buying non-durable goods, stuff we'd buy at the grocery store, uh, stuff we'd buy at Menards, uh, supply stores, stuff like that. And then durable goods, that would be us buying bigger ticket things like cars or four-wheelers or lawnmowers, you know, stuff like that. If we did some simple math, because Mr. Sen Mr. Clem's kind of a simple math guy, out of our 20.5, what was the number there? 20.5 trillion dollars, about 13 trillion of it is just us from a consumption standpoint. Right? And then we break that out saying we spend about roughly eight trillion dollars in the US economy on services, just short of four trillion on non-durable goods and a you know, about 1.3 trillion on durable goods. Right? So historically, we drive the economy, our voluntary transactions are the biggest part of the US GDP. It's not that way in every country, but it's what we got going on here in the US. So what else is out there besides us buying stuff? Next one would be businesses. And we'll often turn this as business investment Historically, if we look over, say, the last 100 years, it's somewhere in the 10 to 20 percent range. And I actually, you know, when we were in class, we'd actually do that math. We'd, we'd 
sit down, I'd hand out the old uh, college macro textbooks and it would have GDP and all of the little subparts for the last hundred years from, from 1929 to 2009. And we'd crunch out that math and, and we would say that historically between 10 to 20% is business. Every now and then you have a very odd situation like we had in like WW2 or the Great Depression that would be outside of this range. But for the most part, pretty consistently, 10 to 20% of our GDP uh, would fall under businesses. So we're in that $3 trillion range. Well, what is that? That's businesses investing in tools, equipment, machinery. That would be businesses looking at inventory or the raw materials that go into their products. Under business investment, it's also going to cover all structures, right? So we're talking both company buildings, strip malls and stuff like that, office buildings, but also homes. Right? So you going out and purchasing a home is not going to fall under consumption. Okay? It's all going to fall under business investment. Third piece to the puzzle is government. And again, it's going to go 10 to 20 percent of GDP. We're talking government salaries. We're talking purchases for products and service, contracts that they have with private citizens. It is not going to count transfer payments. Right? Your Social Security and Medicare payments to grandma and grandpa are not going to count. So with that math, those are the three biggest drivers of what we're calling gross domestic product. Now, 200, 300, 500 years ago, you know, we just worried about ourselves and we didn't necessarily deal with anybody else. Now in our modern world, we're sending stuff all over the place, you know, to Canada, to Mexico, to China, Japan, Korea, everywhere. So we're going to have to deal with this idea of net exports, right? Imports are going to be the goods and services that we purchase from other countries. Exports are going to be the stuff that we sell to other countries. So the formula for net exports is we're going to take our exports first and we're going to compare them to our imports. And if our exports are bigger than our imports, it would be a positive number. If our exports are smaller than our imports, well, then it would be a negative number. Currently in the U.S., we import more than we export. We got more coming in from other countries than we got going out. So we would have a net negative number for this net exports. So as we look at it, um, GDP is going to be the combination of consumption plus business investment plus government plus whatever the net export import number happens to be. So that's what it is. It is the final goods and services uh, produced within the country's borders on a given fiscal year. So let's look at what it's not. It is not going to count secondhand sales. It's not going to count used stuff. Right? If Clem goes out and buys a brand new 2020 pickup truck, that truck was made in 2020 that truck would count towards 2020 gross domestic product. If Clem goes to the Cocado uh, Chevy dealer and says, I want to buy a 2017 vehicle, right? That 2017 used vehicle was already counted once, right? They didn't remake the truck from scratch. Someone bought it, drove it a little bit, traded it in. Now I'm buying it as a used vehicle. Okay, so the second time doesn't count. That would distort economic data, and it would make our GDP look massively large when we really didn't produce anything new. Yes, it was an economic transaction, but it wasn't a new economic transaction. We'll look at intermediate products, okay? Things that are sold, but maybe go into other products and then sold again, right? We don't want to count things two and three and four times. So the question I would ask to help drive this one is, who is the end user? If this was Mr. Clem heading to the marketplace to pick up some chicken and throw it on the grill at home for dinner, I'm the end user. 
If this is someone from, say, Broadway Bees going to the marketplace because they're running out of chicken and they buy it, they're going to go deep fry it and then sell that chicken to someone else. Broadway Bees buying the chicken from the marketplace, that would not count. Why? Because they're going to turn around and sell it and record that transaction. All right, so we don't want to have that chicken being counted four and five and six times. Just like from the farmer to the butcher, from the butcher to the marketplace, from the marketplace to whoever's actually going to consume it. Right? So you got to look and, and answer the question, who is the end user? Non-market transactions. These are things that are going to happen, but there's no real way to track them, you know, kind of in a legal way. So I threw out a couple examples. Maybe you get paid 10 bucks to go babysit the neighbor's kid. Maybe you get paid 20 bucks to mow the neighbor's yard. Now maybe you get a birthday card and there's money in there, right? Well, when you get that birthday card, you don't go to the government and fill out a form and say, hey, I made 10 bucks from Aunt B from my birthday, right? Those are non-market transactions, right? They're economic transactions, but they're not going to be tracked. There's no way to, to value them or put them into gross domestic product. And our last one here is the underground economy, right? Um, your local drug dealer is not going to hand you an invoice when you buy your dime bag of weed or whatever it is you buy from them, right? That's not what they do. Um, or at least a drug dealer I go to doesn't do that. I'm kidding. I don't go to a drug dealer. Uh, anyways. You bet 20 bucks on the result of the Super Bowl. You bet, hey, are we actually, I'm going to bet my buddy 10 bucks that he can't jump over, you know, a campfire, right? Whatever. And, and again, once that is done, there isn't a form you fill out to send to the government to say, hey, this money exchanged hands. So when we look at what it is, again, final goods and services, Bruce, within a country's borders on a given year, it's not counting used stuff. It's not counting stuff that goes into other stuff. It's not counting underground or illegal things, you know, paying somebody 20 bucks to take your economics test. It's not the stuff that's just no way to be trapped. Okay? And that's kind of looking at GDP from both angles of what it is, what it isn't. Consumption being the largest portion of it. Government and business, roughly that 10 to 20 percent, and net exports is a very small amount. As we look at our, our last ideas here, we'll talk about GDP. There's something called nominal GDP, and nominal means we're dealing with current dollars, uh, unadjusted for inflation. inflation. Unadjusted. Real GDP is logically adjusted for inflation, right? And the, we'll talk about inflation uh, next chapter, but the idea that prices go up over time, right? We don't want to see GDP going up because of inflation and say, hey, we made more stuff. We should feel good about it. It's more, hey, the price went up of stuff. We didn't get any more out of it. Right, we produce the same amount of stuff as last year. It just costs more. That's why it looks better. And then our last one is real GDP per capita. Again, that is taken real GDP and divided it by population. And each of these will give us a a feel for how the country is doing, how the economy is doing. Right, whether we compare any one of these. All three of them provide value. And we compare it to what we did with ourselves last year, the year before, the year before. And we can compare it with countries um, to get a feel. Real GDP per capita is probably our biggest measure if we want to compare ourselves to anybody else because every country has different sizes. Right? The size of China compared to India, compared to US, compared to South Africa is very different. Uh, when you divide what the production is by the population, you get a better handle on how the a general standard of living is for that country. That is Chapter 12, Gross Domestic Product, Evaluating an Economy.